Accession, written by Ian M. Banks and read by Peter Kenny. Prologue. A little more than one hundred days into the fortieth year of her confinement, Dajil Gillian was visited in her lonely tower overlooking the sea by an avatar of the great ship that was her home. Far out amongst the heaving grey waves, beneath drifting banks of mist, the great slow bodies of some of the small sea's larger inhabitants humped and slid. Jets of vapour issued from the animals' breathing holes in exhaled blasts that rose like ghostly, insubstantial geysers amongst the flock of birds accompanying the school, causing them to climb and wheel and scream, side slipping and fluttering in the cool air. High above, slipping in and out of pink rubbed layers of cloud, like small slow clouds themselves, other creatures moved. Dirigibles and kites, cruising the upper atmosphere with wings and canopies extended, warming in the watery light of a new day. That light came from a line, not a point in the sky, because the place where Dajil Gillian lived was not an ordinary world. The single strand of fuzzy incandescence began near the far seaward horizon, stretched across the sky and disappeared over the foliage-strewn lip of the two thousand metre high cliff, a kilometre behind the beach and the single tower. At dawn, the sun line would have appeared to rise from the horizon to starboard. At midday it would be directly above the tower, and at sunset it would seem to disappear into the sea to port. It was mid-morning now, and the line lay about halfway up the sky, describing a glowing arc across the vault, like some vast, slow-moving skipping rope forever twirling above the day. On either side of the bar of yellow-white light, the sky beyond, the real sky, the sky above the clouds, could be seen. A solid-looking, brown-black overpresence that hinted at the extreme pressures and temperatures contained within, and where other animals moved in a cloudscape of chemistries entirely toxic to that below, but which in shape and density mirrored the grey, wind-ruffled sea. Steady lines of waves broke on the grey slope of the shingle beach, beating on shattered ground-up shells, tiny fragments of hollow animal carapaces, brittle lengths of light-blighted sea rack, water-smoothed slivers of wood, pitted pebbles of foam stone like dainty marbles of porous bone, and a general assortment of seaside detritus collected from a handful hundred different planets strewn across the greater galaxy. Spray lifted from where the waves fell against the shore, and brought the salty smell of the sea across the beach and the tangle of scrawny plants at its margin, over the low stone wall providing some protection to the tower's seaward garden, and, wrapping around the stubby construction itself and scaling the high wall beyond, intermittently brought the sea's iodine tang to the enclosed garden within, where Dajil Gillian tended raised carpets of bright, spreadling flowers, and the rustling, half-stunted forms of barb trees and shadow-flowering wilderbush. The woman heard the landward gate bell tinkle, but already knew that she had a visitor, because the blackbird Gravius had told her, swooping from the misty sky a few minutes earlier to screech, Company! at her, through a writhing collection of beak-held prey, before beating off again in search of more airborne insects for its winter larder. The woman had nodded at the bird's retreating form, straightening and holding the small of her back as she did so, and then absently stroking her swollen abdomen through the rich fabric of the heavy dress she wore. The message borne by the bird had not needed to be any more elaborate. Throughout the four decades she had lived here alone, Dajil had only ever had to receive one visitor, the avatar of the vessel she thought of as her host and protector, and who was now quickly and accurately pushing aside the barb tree branches as it made its way down the path from the land gate. The only thing that Dajil now found surprising was that her visitor was here at this moment. The avatar had attended her regularly entirely as though dropping casually by while on a walk along the shore for a short visit every eight days, and habitually arrived for a longer, more formal call, at which they had breakfast, lunch or supper, accordingly, every thirty-two days. Going by that schedule, Dajil ought not to be expecting a visit from the ship's representative for another five days. Dajil carefully tucked a stray strand of her long, night-black hair back beneath her plain hairband, and nodded to the tall figure making its way between the twisted trunks. Good morning, she called. The ship's avatar called itself Amorphia, which apparently meant something reasonably profound in a language Dajil did not know and had never considered worth studying. Amorphia was a gaunt, pale, androgynous creature, 
almost skeletally thin, and a full head taller than de Gilles, who was herself both slender and tall. For the last dozen or so years, the Avatar had taken to dressing all in black, and it was in black leggings, black tunic, and a short black jerkin that had appeared now, its cropped blonde hair covered by a similarly dark skullcap. It took the cap off and bowed to Dajil, smiling as though uncertain. Dajil, good morning. Are you well? I am well, thank you, Dajil said, who had long since given up protesting at or indeed being bothered by such probably redundant niceties. She was still convinced that the ship monitored her closely enough to know exactly how well she was, and she was anyway always in perfect health, but was nevertheless prepared to go along with the pretense that it did not watch over her so scrupulously and so had to ask. Still, she did not respond in kind by asking after whatever might pass as the health of either a humanly formed but ship-controlled entity which functioned, as far as she knew, solely as the vessel's contact with her, or indeed the ship itself. Shall we go inside? she asked. Yes, thank you. The upper chamber of the tower was lit from above by the building's translucent glass dome, which looked up to an increasingly cloudy grey sky, and from the edges by gently glowing in hollowed screens, a third of which showed blue-green underwater scenes, usually featuring some of the larger mammals and fish the sea outside contained another third of which displayed bright images of soft-looking water vapour clouds and the huge airborne creatures which played among them, and the last third of which seemingly looked out, on frequencies inaccessible directly to the human eye, into the dense, dark turmoil of the gas-giant atmosphere held compressed in the artificial sky above, where yet stranger beasts moved. Surrounded by brightly decorated covers, cushions and wall hangings, Dajil reached from her couch to a low table of swirlingly carved bone and poured a warmed infusion of herbal juices from a glass pitcher into a goblet of hollowed crystal contained within a filigree of silver. She sat back. Her guest, sitting awkwardly on the edge of a delicate wooden seat, picked up the brimming vessel, looked around the room, and then put the goblet to its lips and drank. Dajil smiled. The avatar Amorphia was deliberately formed to look not simply neither male nor female, but as perfectly, artificially poised between maleness and femaleness as it was possible to be, and the ship had never made any pretense that its representative was other than completely its creature, with only the most cursory intellectual existence of its own. However, it still amused the woman to find her own small ways of proving to herself that this seemingly quite human person was nothing of the kind. It had become one of the small, private games she played with a cadaverously sexless creature. She gave it a glass, cup or goblet, full to the brim of the appropriate drink, indeed sometimes full beyond the brim with only surface tension holding the liquid in the container, and then watched Amorphia lift it to her mouth and sip it, each and every time, without either spilling a single drop or appearing to devote any special attention to the act, a feat no human she had ever encountered could have performed. Dajil sipped her own drink, feeling its warmth make its way down her throat. Within her, her child stirred, and she patted her belly gently without really thinking. The avatar's gaze seemed fixed on one particular hollow screen. Dajil twisted on the couch to look in the same direction and discovered violent action in a couple of the screens displaying the views from the gas giant environment. A school of the habitat's food chain topping predators. Sharp, arrow-headed things, finned like missiles venting gas from steering orifices, were shown from different angles, as they fell together out of some towering column of cloud, and swept through clearer atmosphere down upon a group of vaguely bird-like grazing animals clustered near the edge of an upwelling cloud top. The avian creatures scattered, some crumpling and falling, some beating frantically away to the side, some disappearing, bawled in fright into the cloud. The predators darted and spun amongst them most missing their fleeing prey, a few connecting, biting, slashing and killing. Dajil nodded. Migration time up there, she said. Breeding season soon. She watched a grazer being torn apart and gulped down by a couple of the missile-bodied predators. Mouths to feed, she said quietly, looking away. She shrugged. She recognised some of the predators and had given them her own nicknames, though the creatures she was really interested in were the much bigger, slower-moving animals, 
generally untroubled by the predators, which were like larger, more bulbous relations of the unfortunate grazer flock. Dajil had on occasion discussed details of the various ecologies contained within the ship's habitats with Amorphia, who seemed politely interested, and yet frankly ignorant on the subject, even though the ship's knowledge of the ecosystems was, in effect, total. The creatures belonged to the vessel, after all, whether you regarded them as passengers or pets. Much like herself, Dajil thought sometimes. Amorphia's gaze remained fixed on the screens displaying the carnage taking place in the sky beyond the sky. It is beautiful, isn't it? the Avatar said, sipping at the drink again. It glanced at Dajil, who was looking surprised. In a way, Amorphia added quickly. Dajil nodded slowly. In its own way, yes, of course. She leant forward and put a goblet onto the carved bone table. Why are you here today, Amorphia? she asked. The ship's representative looked startled. It came close, Dajil thought, to spilling its drink. To see how you are, the avatar said quickly. Dajil sighed. Well, she said, we have established that I'm well and... And the child? Amorphia asked, glancing at the woman's belly. Dajil rested her hand on her abdomen. It is... as ever, she said quietly. It is healthy. Good, Amorphia said, folding its long arms about itself and crossing its legs. The creature glanced at the hollow screams again. Dajil was losing patience. Amorphia, speaking as the ship, what is going on? The Avatar looked at the woman with a strange, lost, wild look in its eyes, and for a moment Dajil was worried that something had gone wrong, that the ship had suffered some terrible injury or division, that it had gone quite mad. After all, its fellows regarded it as being half-mad already at best, and left Amorphia abandoned to its own inadequate devices. Then the black-clad creature unfolded itself from the chair and paced to the single small window that faced the sea, drawing aside curtains to inspect the view. It put its hands to its arms, hugging itself. Everything might be about to change, Dajil, the Avatar said hollowly, seemingly addressing the window. It glanced back at her for a moment. It clasped its hands behind its back. The sea may have to become as stone or steel. The sky, too. And you and I may have to part company. It turned to look at her, then came over to where she sat and perched on the other end of the couch, its thin frame hardly making an impression on the cushions. It stared into her eyes. Become like stone, Dajil said still worrying about the mental health of the Avatar or the ship controlling it, or both. What do you mean? We, that is, the ship, Amorphia said, placing one hand on its chest. We may finally have a thing to do. A thing to do, Dajil said. What sort of thing to do? A thing which will require that our world here changes, the Avatar said. A thing which requires that... At the least, we have to put our animated guests into storage with everybody else. Well, save for yourself, and then, perhaps, that we leave all our guests, all our guests, behind in appropriate other habitats. Including me. Including you, Dajil. I see. She nodded. Leaving the tower. Leaving the ship. Well, she thought. What a sudden end to my protected isolation. While you? she asked the Avatar. You go off to do... what? Something, Amorphia told her, without irony. Dajil smiled thinly. Which you won't tell me about. Which I can tell you about. Because? Because I don't yet know myself, Amorphia said. Ah. Dajil thought for a moment, then stood up and went to one of the hollow screens where a camera drone was tracking a light-dappled school of triangular purple-winged rays across the floor of a shallow part of the sea. She knew this school, too. She had watched three generations of these huge, gentle creatures live and die. She had watched them, and she had swum with them, and once assisted in the birth of one of their young. Huge purple wings waved in slow motion 
tips intermittently disturbing little golden wisps of sand. This is a change indeed, Dajil said. Quite so, the avatar said. It paused. And it may lead to a change in your own circumstances. Dajil turned to look at the creature, which was staring intently over the couch at her, with wide, unblinking eyes. A change, Dajil said, her voice betraying her in its shakiness. She stroked her belly again, then blinked and looked down at her hand as though it too had turned traitor. I cannot be sure, Amorphia confessed, but it is possible. Dajil tore off her hairband and shook her head, setting free her long, dark hair, so that it half covered her face as she paced from one side of the room to the other. I see, she said, staring up at the tower's dome, now sprinkled with a light, drizzling rain. She leant against the wall of the hollow screens, her gaze fixed on the avatar. When will all this happen? A few small changes, inconsequential but capable of saving us much time in the future, if carried out now, are happening already, it said. The rest, the main part of it, that will come later, in a day or two, or maybe a week or two, if you agree. Dajil thought for a moment, her face flickering between expressions. Then she smiled. You mean you are asking my permission for all this? Sort of, the ship's representative mumbled, looking down and playing with its fingernails. Dajil let it do this for a while. Then she said, Ship, you have looked after me here. Indulged me. She made an effort to smile at the dark-clad creature, though it was still intently studying its nails. Humoured me for all this time, and I can never express my gratitude sufficiently or hope even to begin paying you back. But I can't make your decisions for you. You must do as you see fit. The creature looked up immediately. Then we'll start tagging all the fauna now, it said. That'll make it quicker to round them up when the time comes. It'll take a few more days after that before we can start the transformation process. From that point, it shrugged. It was the most human gesture she'd ever seen the Avatar make. There may be twenty or thirty days before... before some sort of resolution is reached. Again, it's hard to say. Dajil folded her arms across the bulge of her forty-year-old self-perpetuated pregnancy. She nodded slowly. Well... Thanks for telling me all this. She smiled insincerely, and suddenly she could not hold in the emotions any longer, and looked through tears and black, down-tumbled curls at the long-limbed creature arranged upon her couch and said, So don't you have things you must be doing? From the top of the rain-blown tower, the woman watched the avatar as it retraced its steps along the narrow path through the sparsely treed water meadow to the foot of the two-kilometre cliff, which was skirted by a rough slope of scree. The thin, dark figure, filling half her field of view and grainy with magnification, negotiated a last great boulder at the base of the cliff, then disappeared. Dajil let muscles in her eyes relax. Meanwhile, a set of near-instinctive routines in her brain shut down again. The view returned to normal. Dajil raised her gaze to the overcast. A flight of the box kite creatures was poised in the air just under the cloud surface directly above the tower, dark rectangular shapes hanging still against the greyness as though standing sentinel over her. She tried to imagine what they felt, what they knew. There were ways of tapping directly into their minds, ways that were virtually never used with humans, and whose use, even with animals, was generally frowned upon in proportion to the creature's intelligence. But they did exist, and the ship would let her use them if she asked. There were ways, too, for the ship to simulate all but perfectly what such creatures must be experiencing, and she had used those techniques often enough for a human equivalent of that imitative process to have transferred itself to her mind. And it was that process she invoked now, though to no avail, as it transpired. She was too agitated, too distracted by the things Amorphia had told her to be able to concentrate. Instead, she tried to imagine the ship as a whole in that same trained mind's eye, remembering the occasions when she had viewed the vessel from its remote machines, or gone flying around it, attempting to imagine the changes it was already preparing itself for. 
She supposed they would be unglimpsable from the sort of distance that would let you see the whole craft. She looked around, taking in the great cliff, the clouds and the sea, the darkness of sky. Her gaze swept round the waves, the sea marsh and the water meadows beneath the scree and the cliff. She rubbed her belly without thinking, as she had done for nearly forty years, and pondered on the marginality of things and how quickly change could come, even to something that had seemed set to continue as it was in perpetuity. But then, as she knew too well, the more fondly we imagine something will last forever, the more ephemeral it often proves to be. She became suddenly very aware of her place here, her position. She saw herself and the tower, both within and outside the ship, outside its main hull, distinct, discreet, straight-sided and measured exactly in kilometres, but within the huge envelope of water, air and gas it encompassed, within the manifold layers of its fields. She imagined the force fields sometimes as like the hooped slips, underskirts, skirts, flounces and lace of some ancient formal gown a slab of power and substance floating in a giant spoonful of sea, most of its vast bulk exposed to the air and clouds that formed its middle layer, and around which the sunline curved each day, and all domed with a long field-contained pressure vessel of ferocious heat, colossal pressure and crushing gravity that simulated the conditions of a gas-giant planet. A room, a cave, a hollow husk a hundred kilometres long, hurrying through space with the ship as its vast, flattened kernel. A kernel, an enclosed world inside this world, within which she had not set foot for thirty-nine of these forty unchanging years, having no desire ever again to see that infinite catacomb of the silent undead. All to change, Dajil Gillian thought. All to change and the sea and the sky to become as stone or steel. The black bird, Gravius, settled by her hand on the stone parapet of the tower. What's going on? it croaked. There's something going on, I can tell. What is it, then? What's it all about? Oh, ask the ship, she told it. Already asked it. All it'll say is there's changes coming, like as not. The bird shook its head once, as if trying to dislodge something distasteful from its beak. Don't like changes, it said. It swiveled its head, fixing its beady gaze upon the woman. What sort of changes then, eh? What we got to expect? What we got to look forward to, eh? It tell you. She shook her head. No, she said, not looking at the bird. No, not really. Ha! The bird continued to look at her for a moment then pivoted its head back to look out across the salt marsh. It ruffled its feathers and rose up on its thin black legs. Well, it said, winter's coming, can't delay, best prepare. The bird dropped into the air. Fat lot of youth, she heard it mutter. It opened its wings and flew away on an involute course. Dajil Gillian looked up to the clouds again and the sky beyond. All to change and the sea and the sky to become a stone or steel. She shook her head again and wondered what extremity of circumstance could possibly have so galvanised the great craft that had been her home, her refuge, for so long. Whatever. After four decades in its state of self-imposed internal exile, navigating its own wayward course within its sought-out wilderness as part of the civilization's ulterior and functioning most famously as a repository for quiescent souls and very large animals, it sounded like the general system's vehicle, sleeper service, was again starting to think and behave a little more like a ship which belonged to the culture. Part 1 Outside Context Problem Chapter 1 GCU Grey Area. Signal sequence file hash N4288571119. Swept to tight beam M16.4. Received at N4.28.857.3644. From GSV Honest Mistake to GCU Grey Area. Take a look at this. Signal sequence hash N4288551446 relay. 1. Scan broadcast. M clear. 
Received at N4.28.855.0065 plus. Asterisk C11505 point. Asterisk. 2. Swept beam M1. Received at N4.28.855.0066 minus. SDA. C231492 plus 52. X F A T C at N four point two eight point eight five five three swept beam M two relay received at N four point two eight point eight five five point zero zero seven nine minus from G C U fate amenable to change to G S V ethics gradient and as requested significant development anomaly C four six two nine nine eight four plus five two three at N two eight point eight five five point zero zero six five point four three three nine two four tight beam M sixteen relay received at N four point two eight point eight five five point zero zero eight five from GCU fate amenable to change to GSV ethics gradient and only as required. Developmental anomaly provisionally rated EQT potentially jeopardizing. Found here C nine two five nine nine six nine plus five three three one. My status L five secure. Moving to L six. Instigating all other extreme precautions. Five. Broadcast M clear. Received at N four point two eight point eight five five point zero one. From GCU fate amenable to change to GSV ethics gradient and. Broadcast. The reference point three. Previous compacts and precursor broadcast. Panic over. I misinterpreted. It's a scapsile vault craft. Ho oh, hum. Sorry. Full internal report to follow immediately in high embarrassment factor mode. BSTS H and H BTV. End signal sequence. From GCU grey area to GSV. Honest mistake. Yes. So. There is more. The ship lied. Let me guess. The ship was in fact subverted. It is no longer one of ours. No. It is believed its integrity is intact. That it lied in that last signal, and with good reason. We may have an OCP. They may want your help at any price. Are you interested? An outside context problem. Really. Very well. Keep me informed, do. No, this is serious. I know no more yet, but they are worried about something. Your presence will be required urgently. I dare say. However, I have business to complete here first. Foolish child. Make all haste. Mm hmm. If I did agree, where might I be required? Here. Glyphseek file appended. As you would have gathered, it is from the ITG and concerns our old friend. Indeed. Now that is interesting. I shall be there directly. End signal file. Chapter 2 The ship shuddered. The few remaining lights flickered, dimmed and went out. The alarms dopplered down to silence. A series of sharp impacts registered through the companionway shell walls with resonations in the craft's secondary and primary structure. The atmosphere pulsed with impact echoes. A breeze picked up, then disappeared. The shifting air brought with it a smell of burning and vaporization. Aluminium, polymers associated with carbon fiber and diamond film, superconductor cabling. Somewhere... The drone Cicela Yithalus could hear a human shouting. Then, radiating wildly over the electromagnetic bands, came a voice signal similar to that carried by the air. It became garbled almost immediately, then degraded quickly into meaningless static. The human shout changed to a scream. Then the EM signal cut off. So did the sound. Pulses of radiation blasted in from various directions, virtually information-free. The ship's inertial field wobbled uncertainly, then drew steady and settled again. A shell of neutrinos swept through the space around the companionway. Noises faded. 
EM signatures murmured to silence. The ship's engines and main life support systems were offline. The whole EM spectrum was empty of meaning. Probably the battle had now switched to the ship's AI core and backup photonic nuclei. Then a pulse of energy shot through a multipurpose cable buried in the wall behind, oscillating wildly, then settling back to a steady, utterly unrecognizable pattern. An internal camera patch on a structural beam nearby awakened and started scanning. It can't be over that quickly, can it? Hiding in the darkness, the drone suspected it was already too late. It was supposed to wait until the attack had reached a plateau phase, and the aggressor thought that it was just a matter of mopping up the last dregs of opposition before it made its move. But the attack had been too sudden, too extreme, too capable. The plans the ship had made, of which it was such an important part, could only anticipate so much, only allow for so proportionally greater a technical capability on the part of the attacker. Beyond a certain point, there was simply nothing you could do. There was no brilliant plan you could draw up, or cunning stratagem you could employ, that would not seem laughably simple and unsophisticated to a profoundly more developed enemy. In this instance, they were not perhaps quite at the juncture where resistance became genuinely without point, but from the ease with which the Alentia ship was being taken over, they were not that far away from it either. Remain calm, the machine told itself. Look at the overview. Place this and yourself in context. You are prepared. You are hardened. You are proof. You will do all that you can to survive, as you are, or at the very least, prevail. There is a plan to be put into effect here. Play your part with skill, courage and honor, and no ill will be thought of you by those who survive and succeed. The Alench had spent many thousands of years pitting themselves against every kind of technology and every type of civilizational artifact the vast spaces of the greater galaxy could provide seeking always to understand rather than to overpower, to be changed rather than to enforce change upon others, to incorporate and to share rather than to infect and impose, and in that cause, and with that relatively unmenacing modus operandi, had become perhaps more adept than any, with the possible exception of the mainstream culture's semi-military emissaries known as the contact section, at resisting outright attack without seeming to threaten it. But... For all that the galaxy had been penetrated by so many different explorers in all obvious primary directions to every periphery, however distant, enormous volumes of that encompassing arena remained effectively unexplored by the current crop of in-play civilizations, including the Alench. Quite how utterly that region and beyond was comprehended by the elder species, or even whether they really cared about it at all, was simply unknown. And in those swallowingly vast volumes, amongst those spaces between the spaces, between the stars, around suns, dwarfs, nebulae and holes it had been determined from some distance were of no immediate interest or threat, it was, of course, always possible that some danger waited, some peril lurked, comparatively small, measured against the physical scale of the galaxy's present active cultures, but capable, through a developmental peculiarity or as a result of some form of temporal limbo or exclusionary dormancy, of challenging and besting even a representative of a society as technologically advanced and contextually experienced as the Alench. The drone felt calm, thinking as coldly and detachedly as it could for those few moments on the background to its current predicament. It was prepared, it was ready, and it was no ordinary machine. It was at the cutting edge of its civilization's technology designed to evade detection by the most sophisticated instruments, to survive in almost unimaginably hostile conditions, to take on virtually any opponent, and to suffer practically any damage in concentric stages of resistance. That its ship, its own manufacturer, the one entity that probably knew it better than it knew itself, was apparently being at this moment corrupted, seduced, taken over, must not affect its judgment or its confidence. The displacer, it thought. All I've got to do is get near the displace pod, that's all. Then it felt its body scanned by a point source located near the ship's AI core, and knew its time had come. The attack was as elegant as it was ferocious, and the takeover abrupt almost to the point of instantaneity. The battle memes of the invading alien consciousness, aided by the thought processes and shared knowledge of the by now obviously completely overwhelmed ship. With no interval to provide a margin for error at all, 
The drone shunted its personality from its own AI core to its backup Picaphone complex, and at the same time readied the signal cascade that would transfer its most important concepts, programs, and instructions first to electronic nanocircuitry, then to an atom mechanical substrate, and finally, absolutely as a last resort, to a crude little, though at several cubic centimeters also wastefully large, semi biological brain. The drone shut off and shut down what had been its true mind, the only place it had ever really existed in all its life, and let whatever pattern of consciousness had taken root there perish for lack of energy, its collapsing consciousness impinging on the machine's new mind as a faint, informationless exhalation of neutrinos. The drone was already moving, out from its body niche in the wall and into the companionway space. It accelerated along the corridor, sensing the gaze of the ceiling beam camera patch following it. Fields of radiation swept over the drone's militarized body, caressing, probing, penetrating. An inspection hatch burst open in the companionway just ahead of the drone, and something exploded out of it. Cables burst free, filling to overflowing with electrical power. The drone zoomed, then swooped. A discharge of electricity crackled across the air immediately above the machine and blew a hole in the far wall. The drone twisted through the wreckage and powered down the corridor, turning flat to its direction of travel and extending a disc field through the air to break for a corner, then slamming off the far wall and accelerating up another companionway. It was one of the full cross axis corridors, and so long, the drone quickly reached the speed of sound in the human breathable atmosphere. An emergency door slammed shut behind it a full second after it had passed. A spacesuit shot upwards out of a descending vertical tubeway near the end of the companionway, crumpled to a stop, then reared up and stumbled out to intercept the machine. The drone had already scanned the suit and knew the suit was empty and unarmed. It went straight through it, leaving it flapping, halved against floor and ceiling like a collapsed balloon. The drone threw another disc of field around itself to match the companionway's diameter and rode almost to a stop on a piston of compressed air, then darted round the next corner and accelerated again. A human figure inside a spacesuit lay halfway up the next corridor, which was pressurizing rapidly with a distant roar of gas. Smoke was filling the companionway in the distance, then it ignited and a mixture of gases exploded down the tube. The smoke was transparent to the drone and far too cool to do it any harm, but the thickening atmosphere was going to slow it up, which was doubtless exactly the idea. The drone scanned the human and the suit as best it could as it tore up the smoke filled corridor towards it. It knew the person in the suit well. He had been on the ship for five years. The suit was without weaponry, its systems quiet but doubtless already taken over. The man was in shock and under fierce chemical sedation from the suit's medical unit. As the drone approached the suit, it raised one arm towards the fleeing machine. To a human, the arm would have appeared to move almost impossibly quickly, flicking up at the machine, but to the drone, the gesture looked languid, almost leisurely. Surely this could not be all the threat the suit was capable of. The drone had only the briefest warning of the suit's holstered gun exploding. Until that instant, the gun hadn't even been apparent to the machine's senses, shielded somehow. There was no time to stop, no opportunity to use its own EM effector on the gun's controls to prevent it from overloading, nowhere to take cover. And, in the thick mist of gases flooding the corridor, no way of accelerating beyond the danger. At the same moment, the ship's inertial field fluctuated again and flipped a quarter turn, suddenly, down was directly behind the drone, and the field strength doubled, then redoubled. The gun exploded, tearing the suit and the human it contained apart. The drone ignored the backward tug of the ship's reoriented gravity and slammed against the ceiling, skidding along it for half a meter while producing a cone-shaped field immediately behind it. The explosion blew the companionway's inner shell apart and punched the drone into the corridor ceiling so hard its backup semi-biochemical brain was reduced to a useless paste inside it. That no major pieces of shrapnel struck it counted as a minor miracle. The blast hit the drone's conical field and flattened it, though not before enough of its energy had been directed through the inner and outer fabric of the companionway shell in a fair impersonation of a shaped charge detonation. The corridor's lining punctured and tore to provide a vent for the cloud of gases still flooding into the companionway. They erupted into the depressurized loading bay outside. The drone paused momentarily, 
letting debris tear past it in a hurricane of gas. Then, in the semi-vacuum which resulted, powered off again, ignoring the escape route which had opened behind it, and racing down to the next companionway junction. The offline displacer pod the drone was making for hung outside the ship hull only ten metres round the next corner. The drone curved through the air, bounced off another wall on the floor, and raced into the hull wall companionway to find a machine similar to itself screaming towards it. It knew this machine, too. It was its twin. It was its closest sibling, friend, lover, comrade in all the great distributed, forever-changing civilization that was the Alench. X-ray lasers flickered from the converging machine, only millimeters above the drone, producing detonations somewhere way behind it while it flicked on its mirror shields, flipped in the air, ejected its old AI core and the semi-biochemical unit into the air behind it, and spun around in an outside loop to continue down the companionway. The two components it had ejected flared beneath it, instantly vaporizing and surrounding it with plasma. It fired its own laser at the approaching drone. The blast was mirrored off, blossoming like fiery petals, which raged against and pierced the corridor walls, and affected the displacer pod controls, powering the machinery up into a preset sequence. The attack on its photonic nucleus came at the same moment, manifesting itself as a perceived disturbance in the space-time fabric, warping the internal structure of the drone's light-energized mind from outside normal space. It's using the engines, thought the drone, senses swimming its awareness seeming to break up and evaporate somehow as it effectively began to go unconscious. FM to AM, cried a tiny, long-thought-out subroutine. It felt itself switch to amplitude modulation instead of frequency modulation. Reality snapped back into focus again, though its senses still remained disconnected and thoughts still felt odd. But if I don't react otherwise... The other drone fired at it again, zooming towards it on an intercept course. Ramming! How inelegant! The drone mirrored the rays, still refusing to adjust its internal photonic topography to allow for the wildly shifting wavelength changes demanding attention in its mind. The displacer pod, just the other side of the ship's hull, hummed into life. A set of coordinates corresponding with the drone's own present position appeared flickering in the drone's awareness, describing the volume of space that would be nipped off from the surface of the normal universe and hurled far beyond the stricken Elentia ship. Damn, might make it yet. Just roll with it, the drone thought dizzily. It rolled, literally, physically, in mid-air. Light, bursting from all around it and bearing the signature of plasma fire, drummed into its casing with what felt like the pressure of a small nuclear blast. Its fields mirrored what they could, the rest roasted the machine to white heat and started to seep inside its body, beginning to destroy its more vulnerable components. Still it held out, completing its role through the superheated gases around it, mostly vaporized floor tiles, it noted, dodging the shape spearing towards it that was its murderous twin, noticing, almost lazily now, that the displacer pod had completed its power-up and was moving to clasp-stroke-discharge, while its mind involuntarily registered the information contained in the blast of radiation and finally caved in under the force of the alien purpose encoded within. It felt itself split in two, leaving behind its real personality, giving that up to the invading power of its photonic core's abducted intent and becoming slowly, balefully aware of its own abstracted echo of existence in clumsy electronic form. The displacer on the other side of the hull wall completed its cycle. It snapped a field around and instantly swallowed a sphere of space not much bigger than the head of a human. The resulting bang would have been quite loud in anything other than the mayhem the onboard battle had created. The drone, barely larger than two adult human hands placed together, fell smoking, glowing to the side wall of the companionway, which was now in effect the floor. Gravity returned to normal, and the drone clunked to the floor proper, clattering onto the heat-scarred undersurface beneath the chimney that was a vertical companionway. Something was raging in the drone's real mind, behind walls of insulation. Something powerful and angry and determined. The machine produced a thought equivalent to a sigh or a shrug of the shoulders and interrogated its atomechanical nucleus just for good form's sake. But that avenue was irredeemably heat-corrupted. Not that it mattered. It was over all over. Done. 
Then the ship hailed it quite normally over its communicator. Now why didn't you try that in the first place? thought the drone. Well, it answered itself, because I wouldn't have replied, of course. It found that almost funny. But it couldn't reply. The comm unit's send facility had been wasted by the heat too, so it waited. Gas drifted. Stuff cooled, other stuff condensed, making pretty designs on the floor. Things creaked. Radiations played, and hazy EM indications suggested the ship's engines and major systems were back online. The heat making its way through the drone's body dissipated slowly, leaving it alive, but still crippled and incapable of movement or action. It would take it days to bootstrap the routines that would even start to replace the mechanisms that would construct the self-repair nano-units. That seemed quite funny, too. The vessel made noises and signals like it was moving off through space again. Meanwhile, the thing in the drone's real mind went on raging. It was like living with a noisy neighbour or having a headache, thought the drone. It went on waiting. Eventually, a heavy maintenance unit, about the size of a human torso, and escorted by a trio of small, self-motivated effector sidearms, appeared at the far end of the vertical companionway above it, and floated down through the currents of climbing gas until they were directly over the small, pocked, smoking and splintered casing of the drone. The effector weapon's aim had stayed locked onto the drone the whole way down. Then, one of the guns powered up and fired at the small machine. Shit! Bit summary, damn it, the drone had time to think. But the effector was powered only enough to provide a two-way communication channel. Hello, said the maintenance unit through the gun. Hello yourself. The other machine is gone. I know, my twin. Snapped. Displaced. Get thrown a long way by one of those big displaced pods, something that small. One-off coordinates, too. Never find it. The drone knew it was babbling. Its electronic mind was probably under a factor incursion, but too damn stupid even to know it, and so gibbering as a side effect, but it couldn't stop itself. Yep, total gone. Entity overboard. One throw, X, Y, Zs. Never find it. No point in even looking for it, unless you want me to step into the breach too, of course. I'd go take a squint if you like, if the pod's still up for it. Personally, it wouldn't be too much trouble. Did you mean all that to happen? The drone thought about lying, but now it could feel the effector weapon in its mind, and knew that not only the weapon and the maintenance drone, but the ship and whatever had taken over all of them could see it was thinking about lying. So, feeling that it was itself again, but knowing it had no defences left, wearily it said, Yes. From the beginning? Yes, from the beginning. We can find no trace of this plan in your ship's mind. Well, nar nar ni fucking nar nar to you then, prick brains. Illuminating insults. Are you in pain? No. Look, who are you? Your friends. I don't believe this. I thought this ship was smart, but it gets taken over by something that talks like a hegemonizing swarm out of an infant's tail. We can discuss that later. But what was the point of displacing beyond our reach your twin machine rather than yourself? It was ours, was it not? Or did we miss something? You missed something. The displace was programmed to... Oh, just read my brains. I'm not sore, but I'm tired. Silence for a moment. Then... I see. The displacer copied your mind state to the machine it ejected. That was why we found your twin so handily placed to intercept you when we realized you were not yet ours and there might be a way out via the displacer. One should always be prepared for every eventuality, even if it's getting shafted by a dope with bigger guns. Well, if cuttingly put, actually, I believe your twin machine may have been badly damaged by the plasma implosion directed at yourself. And as all you were trying to do was get away, rather than find a novel method of attacking us, the matter is anyway not of such great importance. Very convincing. Ah, sarcasm. Well, never mind. Come and join us now. Do I have a choice in this? What? You would rather die? Or do you think we would leave you to repair yourself as you are, were, and hence attack us in the future. 
Just checking. We shall transcribe you into the ship's own core with the others who suffered mortality. And the humans? The mammal crew? What of them? Are they dead or in the core? Three are solely in the core, including the one whose weapon we used to try to stop you. The rest sleep with inactive copies of the brain states in the core for study. We have no intentions of destroying them, if that's what concerns you. Do you care for them particularly? Never could stand the squidgy great slow lumps myself. What a harsh machine you are. Come. I'm a soldier drone, you cretin. What do you expect? And anyway, I'm harsh? You just wasted my ship and all my friends and comrades, and you call me harsh? You insisted upon invasionary contact, not us. And there have been no mind-state total losses at all, except that brought about by your displacer. But let me explain all this in more comfort. Look, can't you just kill me and get it o- But with that, the effect weapon altered its setup momentarily, and, in effect, sucked the little machine's intellect out of its ruined and smouldering body. Chapter 3 Bargain a hoffer, my good friend. Welcome. Colonel Alien Befriender First Class, five-tied Humidier the Seventh of the Winter Hunter tribe, threw four of his limbs around the human and hugged him tightly to his central mass, pursing his lip fronds and pressing his front beak to the human's cheek. <laughs> Gaynar Hofoen felt the diplomatic force officer's kiss through the few millimetres thickness of the gel field suit as a moderately sharp impact on his jaw, followed by a powerful sucking that might have led someone less experienced in the diverse and robust manifestations of affront of friendliness to conclude that the being was either trying to suck his teeth out through his cheek or had determined to test whether a cultured gel field contact protection suit, Mark 12, could be ripped off its wearer by a localised partial vacuum. What the crushingly powerful four-limbed hug would have done to a human unprotected by a suit designed to withstand pressures comparable to those found at the bottom of an ocean probably did not bear thinking about. But then, a human exposed without protection to the conditions required to support a frontal life would be dying in at least three excitingly different and painful ways anyway, without having to worry about being crushed by a cage of leg-thick tentacles. Five Tide, good to see you again, you brigand. Genahofoen said, slapping the affronter about the beak end with the appropriate degree of enthusiastic force to indicate bonhomie. And you, and you, the affronter said. He released the man from its grasp, twirled with surprising speed and grace, and, clasping one of the human's hands in a tentacle end, pulled him through the roaring crush of affronters near the nest space entrance to a clearer part of the web membrane. The nest space was hemispherical in shape and easily a hundred metres across. It was used mainly as a regimental mess and dining hall, and so was hung with flags, banners, the hides of enemies, bits and pieces of old weapons, and military paraphernalia. The curved, veined-looking walls were similarly adorned with plaques, company, battalion, division, and regimental honour plaques, and the heads, genitals, limbs, or other acceptably distinctive body parts of old adversaries. Gaynor Hofoen had visited this particular nest space before on a few occasions. He looked up to see if the three ancient human heads which the hall sported were visible this evening. The diplomatic force prided itself on having the tact to order that the recognisable trophy bits of any given alien be covered over when a still animate example of that species paid a visit, but sometimes they forgot. He located the heads, scarcely more than three little dots, hidden high on one subdividing drape wall, and noted that they had not been covered up. The chances were this was simply an oversight, though it was equally possible that it was entirely deliberate, and either meant to be an exquisitely weighted insult, carefully contrived to keep him unsettled and in his place, or intended as a subtle but profound compliment to indicate that he was being accepted as one of the boys, and not like one of those snivellingly timid aliens who got all upset and shirty just because they saw a close relative's hide gracing an occasional table. That there was absolutely no rapid way of telling which of these possibilities was the case was exactly the sort of trait the human found most endearing in the affront. It was, equally, just the kind of attribute the culture in general, and his predecessors in particular, had found to be such a source of despair. Gaynar Hofoen found himself grinning wryly at the three distant heads and half hoping that Five Tide would notice. Five Tide's eye stalks swiveled. Waiters come! 
he bellowed at hovering juvenile eunuch. Here, wretch! The waiter was half the size of the big male, and childishly unscarred, unless you counted the stump of the creature's rear beak. The juvenile floated closer, trembling even more than politeness dictated, until it was within a tentacle reach. This thing, roared Five Tide, flicking a limb end to indicate Gaynor Hafoen, is the alien beast human you should already have been briefed on if your chief is to avoid a sound thrashing. It might look like prey, but it is in fact an honoured and treasured guest, and it needs feeding much as we do. Rush to the animals and outworlders' serving table and fetch the sustenance prepared for it. Now! Five Tide screamed, his voice producing a small, visible shockwave in the mostly nitrogen atmosphere. The juvenile eunuch waiter vented away with suitable alacrity. Five Tide turned to the human. There's a special treat for you, he shouted. We have prepared some of the disgusting glop you call food, and a container of liquid based on that poisonous water stuff. God shit how we spoil you, eh? He tentacle slapped the human in the midriff. The Gelfield suit absorbed the blow by stiffening. Gaina Hafoin staggered a little to one side, laughing. Your generosity near bowls me over. Good. Do you like my new uniform? the affronter officer asked, sucking back a little from the human and pulling himself up to his full height. Gaina Hafoin made a show of looking the other being up and down. The average fully grown affronter consisted of a mass the shape of a slightly flattened ball, about two metres in girth and one and a half in height, suspended under a veined, frilled gas sack, which varied in diameter between one and five metres, according to the affronter's desired buoyancy, and which was topped by a small sensor bump. When an affronter was in aggressive, defensive mode, the whole sack could be deflated and covered by protective plates on the top of the central body mass. The principal eyes and ears were carried on two stalks above the forebeak, covering the creature's mouth. A rear beak protected the genitals. The anus, gas vent, was positioned centrally under the main body. To the central mass were attached, congenitally, between six and eleven tentacles of varying thicknesses and lengths, at least four of which normally ended in flattened, leaf-shaped paddles. The actual number of limbs possessed by any particular adult male affronter one encountered entirely depended on how many fights and or hunts it had taken part in and how successful a part in them it had played. An affronter with an impressive array of scars and more stumps than limbs was considered either an admirably dedicated sportsman or a brave but stupid and probably dangerous incompetent, depending entirely on the individual's reputation. Five Tide himself had been born with nine limbs, considered the most propitious number amongst the best families, providing one had the decency to lose at least one in duel or hunt, and had duly lost one to his fencing master while at military college in a duel over the honour of the fencing master's chief wife. It's a very impressive uniform, Five Tide, Gainer said. Yes, it is rather, isn't it? The affronter said, flexing his body. Five Tide's uniform consisted of multitudinous broad straps and sashes of metallic-looking material, which were crisscrossed over his central mass and dotted with holsters, sheaths and brackets, all occupied by weapons, but sealed for the formal dinner they were here to attend. The glittering discs, Gaynor Hawthorne knew, were the equivalents of medals and decorations, and the associated portraits of particularly impressive game animals killed and rivals seriously maimed. A group of discreetly blank portrait discs indicated the females of other clans Five Tide could honourably claim to have successfully impregnated. The discs, edged with precious metals, bore witness to those who had put up a struggle. Colours and patterns on the sashes indicated Five Tide's clan, rank and regiment, which was what the diplomatic force to which Five Tide belonged basically was, a point not wisely ignored by any species who wished to have, or just found themselves having, any dealings with the affront. Five Tide pirouetted, gas sacks swelling and buoying him up, so that he rose above the spongy surface of the nest space, limbs dangling, taking hardly any of his weight. Am I not resplendent? The Gelfield suit's translator decided that the adjective Five Tide had chosen to describe himself should be rendered with a florid rolling of the syllables involved, making the affronter officer sound like an overly stagey actor. Positively intimidating. Gena Hofoen agreed. Thank you, Five Tide said, sinking down again so that his eye stalks were level with the human's face. The stalk's gaze rose and dipped, looking the man up and down. 
Well, your own apparel is uh, different at long last, and I'm sure most smart by the standards of your own people. The posture of the affronter's eye stalks indicated that he found something highly pleasing in this statement. Probably Five Tide was congratulating himself on being incredibly diplomatic. Thank you, Five Tide, Ginnar Hoffoen said, bowing. He thought himself rather overdressed. There was the Gelfield suit itself, of course, so much a second skin it was possible to forget he wore it at all. Normally the suit was nowhere more than a centimetre thick, and averaged only half that, yet it could keep him comfortable in environments even more extreme than that required for a fronter life. Unfortunately, some idiot had let slip that the culture tested such suits by displacing them into the magma chambers of active volcanoes and letting them pop out again. Not true. The laboratory tests were rather more demanding, though it had been done once, and it was just the sort of thing a show-off culture manufactory would do to impress people. This was definitely not the kind of information to bandy about in the presence of beings as inquisitive and physically exuberant as affronters. It only put ideas into their minds. And while the affront habitat Gaynar Hofoen lived within didn't recreate conditions on a planet to the extent that it had volcanoes, there had been a couple of times after Five Tide had asked the human to confirm the volcano story when he'd thought he'd caught the diplomatic force officer looking at him oddly, exactly as though he was trying to work out what natural phenomena or piece of apparatus he had access to he could use to test out this remarkable and intriguing protectivity. The Gelfield suit possessed something called a node-distributed brain, which was capable of translating with seeming effortlessness every nuance of Gaynor Hofoen's speech to the affronters, and vice versa, as well as effectively rendering any other sonic, chemical, or electromagnetic signal into human meaningful information. Unhappily, the processing power required for this sort of technical gee-wizzery meant that according to culture convention, the suit had to be sentient. Gaynor Hofoen had insisted on a model with the intelligence fixed at the lower limit of the acceptable intellectual range, but it still meant that the suit literally had a mind of its own, even if it was node-distributed, one of those technical terms Gaynor Hofoen took some pride in having no idea concerning the meaning of. The result was a device which was almost as much a metaphorical pain to live with as it was, in a literal sense, a pleasure to live within. It looked after you perfectly, but it couldn't help constantly reminding you of the fact. Typical culture, thought Gaynor Hofoen. Ordinarily, Gaynor Hofoen had the suit appear milkily silver to an affronter over most of its surface, while keeping the hands and head transparent. Only the eyes had never looked quite right. They had to bulge out a bit if he was to be able to blink normally. As a result, he usually wore sunglasses when he went out which did seem a little incongruous, submerged in the dim photochemical fog characteristic of the atmosphere a hundred kilometres beneath the sunlit cloud tops of the affront's homeworld, but which were useful as a prop. On top of the suit, he usually wore a gilet with pockets for gadgets, gifts and bribes, and a crotch-cupping hip holster containing a couple of antique but impressive-looking handguns. In terms of offensive capability, the pistols provided a sort of minimum level of respectability for Gaynor Hofoen. Without them, no affronter could possibly allow themselves to be seen taking so puny an outworlder seriously. For the regimental dinner, Gaynor Hofoen had reluctantly accepted the advice of the module in which he lived, and dressed in what it assured him was a most fetching outfit of knee boots, tight trousers, short jacket and long cloak, worn off the shoulder, and, in addition to an even bigger pair of pistols than usual, had slung over his back a matched pair of what the module assured him were three millimeter caliber heavy micro rifles, two millennia old but still in full working order, and very long and gleamingly impressive. He had balked at the tall, drum shaped, much betasseled hat the module had suggested, and they'd compromised on a dress armored half helm, which made it look as though something with six long metallic fingers was cradling his head from behind. Naturally, each article in this outfit was covered in its own equivalent of a gel field, protecting it from the coldly corrosive pressure of the affronter environment, though the module had insisted that if he wanted to fire the micro-rifles for politeness' sake, they would function perfectly well. Sire! yelped the eunuch juvenile waiter, skittering to a stop on the nest space surface at Five Tide's side. Cradled in three of its limbs was a large tray full of transparent, multi-walled flasks of various sizes. What? yelled Five Tide. The alien guest's food stuff, sir. Five Tide extended a tentacle and rummaged around on the tray, knocking things over. 
The waiter watched the containers topple, fall, and roll on the tray it held with an expression of wide-eyed terror. Gaina Hafoa needed no ambassadorial training to recognise. The genuine danger to the waiter of any of the containers breaking was probably small. Implosions produced relatively little shrapnel, and the affront to poisonous contents would freeze too quickly to present much of a danger. But the punishment awaiting a waiter who made so public a display of its incompetence was probably in proportion to that conspicuousness, and the creature was right to be concerned. What is this? Five Tide demanded, holding up a spherical flask, three quarters full of liquid, and shaking it vigorously in front of the eunuch juvenile's beak. Is this a drink? Is it well? I don't know, sir. The waiter wailed. It, it looks like it is. Imbecile. Muttered Five Tide, then presented the flask gracefully to Gaina Hafoen. Honored guest, he said, please tell us if our efforts please you. Gaina Hafoen nodded and accepted the flask. Five Tide turned on the waiter. Well, he shouted, don't just float there, you moron. Take the rest to the Savage Talker Battalion table. He flicked a tentacle towards the waiter, who flinched spectacularly. Its gas sac deflated, and it ran across the floor membrane for the banqueting area of the nest space, dodging the affronters gradually making their way in that direction. Five Tide turned briefly to acknowledge the greeting slap of a fellow diplomatic force officer, then rotated back, produced a bulb of fluid from one of the pockets on his uniform, and clinked it carefully against the flask Gaina Hafoen held. To the future of affront cultural relations, he rumbled. May our friendship be long and our wars be short. Five Tide squeezed the fluid into his mouth beak. So short you could miss them entirely, Gaina Hathorn said tiredly, more because it was the sort of thing a culture ambassador was supposed to say, rather than because he sincerely meant it. Five Tide snorted derisively and dodged briefly to one side, apparently attempting to stick one tentacle end up the anus of a passing fleet captain, who wrestled the tentacle aside and snapped his beak aggressively before joining in Five Tide's laughter and exchanging the heartfelt hellos and thunderous tentacle slaps of dear friends. There would be a lot of this sort of stuff this evening, Gaina Hafoa knew. The dinner was an all-male gathering, and therefore likely to be fairly boisterous, even by affronter standards. Gaina Hafoa put the flask's nozzle to his mouth. The gelfield suit attached itself to the nozzle, equalised pressures, opened the flask's seal, and then, as Gaina Hafoen tipped his head back, had what for the suit's brain was a good long think before it permitted the liquid inside to wash through it and into the man's mouth and throat. Fifty-fifty water alcohol, plus traces of partially toxic herb-like chemicals, closest to lysate seeker spirit, said a voice in Gaina Hafoen's head. If I were you, I'd bypass it. If you were me, Sue, you'd welcome inebriation just to mitigate the effects of having to suffer your intimate embrace, Gaina Hafoen told the thing as he drank. Oh, we're in tetchy mode, are we? said the voice. I done it with your good self. It is good by your bizarre criteria? Five Tide inquired, eye stalks nodding at the flask. Gaina Hafoen nodded as the drink warmed its way down his throat to his stomach. He coughed, which had the effect of making the gel field ball out round his mouth like silvery chewing gum for a moment, something which he knew Five Tide thought was the second funniest thing a human could do in a gel field suit, only beaten for amusement value by a sneeze. Unhealthy and poisonous, Gaina Hafoen told the affronter. Perfect copy. My compliments to the chemist. I'll pass them on, Five Tide said, crushing his drinking bulb and flicking it casually at a passing servant. Come now, he said, taking the human by the hand again. Let's to table. My stomach's as empty as a coward's bowels before battle. No, no, no. You have to flick it like this, you stupid human, or the scratch hands will get it. Watch. A front of formal dinners were held round a collection of giant circular tables, anything up to fifteen metres across each of which looked down into a bait pit where the animal fights took place between and during courses. In the old days, at banquets held by the military and within the higher reaches of a front society, contests between groups of captured aliens had been a particular and reasonably regular highlight, despite the fact that mounting such fights was often hideously expensive and fraught with technical complications due to the different chemistries and pressures involved, not to mention frequently presenting a very real danger to the observing dinner guests.
Who could forget the ghastly explosion at the Deep Scars Table Five back in three three four, when every single guest had met a messy but honourable end, due to the explosion of a highly pressurised bait pit domed to simulate the atmosphere of a gas giant. Indeed, amongst the people who really mattered, it was one of the most frequently voiced objections to the affront's membership of the informal association of other spacefaring species that having to be nice to other lesser species rather than giving the brutes a chance to prove their mettle against the glorious force of affront arms had resulted in a distinct dulling of the average society dinner. Still, on really special occasions these days, the fights would be between two affronters with a dispute of a suitably dishonourable nature, or between criminals. Such contests usually required that the protagonists be hobbled, tied together, and armed with sliver knives, scarcely more substantial than hatpins, thus ensuring that the fights didn't end too quickly. Gaina Hofoen had never been invited to one of those, and didn't expect he ever would be. It wasn't the sort of thing one let an alien witness, and besides, the competition for seats was scarcely less ferocious than the spectacle everyone desired to witness. For this dinner. Held to commemorate the 1885th anniversary of the affront's first decent space battle against enemies worthy of the name, the entertainment was arranged to bear some relationship to the dishes being served, so that the first fish course was accompanied by the partial flooding of the pit with ethane and the introduction into it of specially bred fighting fish. Five Tide took great pleasure in describing to the human the unique nature of the fish, which were equipped with mouth parts so specialised the fish could not feed normally and had to be raised leaching vital fluids from another type of fish bred specially to fit into their jaws. The second course was of small edible animals, which to Gaina Hofoen appeared furry and arguably even cute. They raced round a trench track set into the top of the pit at the inner edge of the circular table, pursued by something long and slithery-looking with a lot of teeth at each end. The cheering, hooting affronters roared, thumped the tables, exchanged bets and insults, and stabbed at the little creatures with long forks while shoveling cooked, prepared versions of the same animals into their beaks. Scratch hounds made up the main course. And while two sets of the animals, each about the size of a corpulent human but eight-limbed, slashed and tore at each other with razor-sharp prosthetic jaw implants and strap claws, diced scratchhound was served on huge trenchers of compacted vegetable matter. The affronters considered this the highlight of the whole banquet. One was finally allowed to use one's miniature harpoon, quite the most impressive-looking utensil in each place setting. To impale chunks of meat from the trenches of one's fellow diners, and with a skilful flick of the attached cable, which Five Tide was now trying to teach the human, transfer it to one's own trencher, beak, or tentacle, without losing it to the scratch hands in the pit, having it intercepted by another dinner guest en route, or losing the thing entirely over the top of one's gas sack. The beauty of it is, Five Tide said, throwing his harpoon at the trencher of an admiral distracted by a failed harpoon strike of his own, that the clearest target is the one furthest away. He grunted and flicked, snapping the piece of speared scratchhound up and away from the other affronter's place an instant before the officer to the admiral's right could intercept the prize. The morsel sailed through the air in an elegant trajectory that ended with Five Tide barely having to rise from his place to snap his beak shut on it. He swivelled left and right, acknowledging appreciative applause in the form of whip-snapped tentacles, then settled back into the padded Y-shaped bracket that served as a seat. You see. He said, making an obvious swallowing motion and spitting out the harpoon and its cable. I see, Gena Hafoen said, still slowly recoiling the harpoon cable from his last attempt. He sat to Five Tide's right in a Y bracket place modified simply by placing a board across its prongs. His feet dangled over the debris trench which circled the perimeter of the table and which the suit assured him was reeking in the manner approved by Afranta Gourmets. He flinched and dodged to one side, nearly falling off the seat, as a harpoon sailed by to his left, narrowly missing him. Gaynar Hafoen acknowledged the laughter and exaggerated apologies from the front officer five along the table, who had been aiming at Five Tide's plate, and politely gathered up the harpoon and cable and passed it back. He returned to picking at the miniature pieces of indifferent food in the pressurized containers in front of him. Transferring them to his mouth with a gel field utensil shaped like a little four-fingered hand, his legs swinging over the debris trench, he felt like a child dining with adults. Nearly got you there, a、eh, human! Ha ha ha! Roared the diplomatic force colonel, his other side from Five Tide. 
He slapped Gaynor Hofoen on the back with a tentacle and threw him half off the seat and onto the table. Oops, the colonel said, and jerked Gaynor Hofoen back with a teeth-rattling wrench. Gaynor Hofoen smiled politely and picked his sunglasses off the table. The diplomatic force colonel went by the name of Quick Temper. It was the sort of title which the culture found depressingly common amongst the fronter diplomats. Five Tide had explained the problem was that certain sections of the affront old guard were slightly ashamed their civilization had a diplomatic service at all, and so tried to compensate for what they were worried might look to other species suspiciously like a symptom of weakness by ensuring that only the most aggressive and xenophobic affronters became diplomats, to forestall anybody forming the dangerously preposterous idea the affront were going soft.